Hi, this is Charles Malky, biologist and plant expert with Ivory Organics, where we grow cool plants. And today we're here at the Silmar Agricultural Center, which is led by Steve List. And we're here with the Dave Wilson Nursery special guest speaker, Tom Spellman, that'll be talking about several educational gardening lessons to help make this your best growing season ever. Enjoy. here at Selmar High School. We're going to say this is the sixth annual fruit tree symposium and every year Tom gets to speak, right? So far. Do we have you down for next year? I'm hoping you might find somebody else. No. <laughs> no. We don't know anybody that has your expertise or your charisma. So again, I'm going to introduce wow. Tom in a second. But again, my name is Steve. I teach here. Thank you all for coming. You know that not only is this a workshop for the fruit trees, but it's also a fundraiser for CRFG, and then they're going to help us with some goodies. Today is a great day to ask questions about fruit trees. you got some of the best experts in the world here, and I'm not exaggerating. You know, these two guys know more than all of us put together, I think. And I'm not just being kind because you gave me the donation, but yes, I am. <laughs> Anyhow, I'm going to introduce the president of the Los Angeles chapter of CRFG. Let's give, let's give Tony a big hand. Thank you, sir. So Steve and I go back quite a ways, but my wife goes back to junior high school with Steve, and so we kind of, our paths met years and years later. So if you want any dirt, be here and say thank you. So Tom Spellens could talk to us about fruit trees and everything you want to know and questions. He's the man. Tony, Tony. There's a gift there for him. Were you not listening to what I just said? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm just an argument. <laughs> <laughs> you were outside, Steve. You yeah, that. but I better go back outside. I'm, I'm not giving up the bat. Anyhow, you have another Felco there, so don't lose that. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Thanks for coming in today and allowing me a little bit of your time to give you my uh, opinions on backyard orchard culture. So um, main topic today is what we do in our backyards as far as fruit growing as opposed to what a commercial grower would do to say make their living. If I was a commercial grower of Hass avocados or uh, Washington navel oranges or late Legrand nectarines or Fuji apples or whatever, I would be looking at growing a substantial crop of material where I could come in all at one time and bring in trucks and equipment and people and get all my fruit harvested and get it shipped out to um, a packer for, uh, for washing, for grading, for cold storage and distribution to retail markets. That's the way I would make my living. So I, I wanna get a lot of fruit out there at, at one time so that I can get my check and, and start to to, you know pay my bills for the year so a commercial grower looking for a lot of fruit at one time you guys as opposed to that should be looking for a little bit of fruit all the time you don't have need for a commercial harvest of uh, 350 pounds of late Legrand nectarines off of your nectarine tree you know they ripen over a couple of weeks what are you gonna do with what are you gonna do with a hundred pounds of of late Legrand nectarines in two or three weeks. It's like Santa Rosa Plum or Blenheim apricots or any of those prunus varieties, they hold on the tree for a very short period of time. So what I'm really looking for when it comes to prunus varieties is I'm looking to have successive ripening varieties that'll give me fruit over the season instead of a lot of fruit at one time. So there are really three main concepts to backyard orchard culture. If you just take these three concepts home today, in, in the long run, you'll, you'll end up being a much more effective backyard grower than before. So number one, and you guys know my philosophy on that, I don't think I really have to explain it to anybody, but size control your trees so they're manageable for you. I don't think I need to go into detail and tell you 
how difficult it is to throw a bird net over a Santa Rosa plum that's as high as that ceiling. So if you want to save your fruit, if you want to save your crop and maintain your trees, if you want to get out there and, and get your work done in a, in a timely manner, if I need to thin, if I need to prune, if I need to harvest fruit, I want varieties of, of prunus to be in an area where they're easily accessible. So I'm looking at growing a tree that's about so high. I want to make sure that I can do my work from the ground. If I have to climb up into the tree to thin or to harvest, it becomes cumbersome, it becomes difficult. And I, quite frankly, I lose interest really easy. So I want something where the trees are back down to a manageable size for me. Now that pretty much goes for prunus. If, if I'm talking about citrus, if I'm talking about avocados, things that hang on the tree for weeks or months, like Hass avocados can hang on the tree for eight months. I can harvest Washington navel oranges for five and a half or six months. Most varieties of citrus and avocados are easily manageable as a larger tree because the fruit hangs on the tree for a longer period of time. So if you choose a bigger tree, fine. And, and I found over the years that an eight foot Hass avocado doesn't produce enough avocados for me and my family. So I'm okay with a 15 foot Hass avocado because I can go out every Sunday morning with a pole and a, and a basket picker and pick all the fruit that I need for a week or 10 days and do that repetitively week after week after week. So I can always manage my fruit. It takes a few days for avocados to ripen up. I can always manage my fruit accordingly with a, with a bigger tree. So that's my exception. If it's something that ripens up over a two to four week period, I want a small manageable tree. If it ripens up over two months, three months, four months, six months, I'm okay with a, with a larger tree. So manageability is in perspective to the, to the crop time on the tree. But I'm never gonna tell you how big your tree should be. What I'm gonna tell you is manage your trees so that they're manageable for you and you're the one that's gonna choose that size. If you wanna manage a 15 foot Santa Rosa plum tree, be my guest, have a have at it. It's, it's not that difficult, but if you're managing a big number of trees, it becomes more and more difficult all the time with a, with a larger number of trees. So for me, right here, size control on a, on a prunus is gonna be seven and a half, eight feet tall. I wanna be able to do my work from the ground. So that's the number one concept. That's the most important consideration right there is manage your trees so that they're size managed for you. Number two, we talked about it a little bit already, successive ripening. I don't want a lot of fruit at any one given time. I want a little bit of fruit all the time. So if I was to take the same footprint where one Santa Rosa plum tree was growing, 150 square feet, 200 square feet, and I took that space, and instead of putting in one Santa Rosa plum, I put in a beauty plum that ripens up in, in May and into June. I put in my Santa Rosa that's late June and into July. I put in a burgundy that's uh, mid-July and into August. I put in a flavor grenade pluot that is August and into around the 1st of September. All four of those trees growing in the footprint of one large tree, now I have two and a half or three months worth of successive ripening fruit out of that same amount of space. Doesn't that make more sense? From a backyard grower's perspective? Absolutely. So the next question I usually get at that point is, well, how come you know farmers don't do that? You know, I want to grow like a farmer. I want to be a farmer. But really, when you look at it, when you look at the tree spacing in an orchard, when you look at a 15-foot roadway, or you look at 10 feet in between trees, or 12 or 14 feet in between trees, what's all that space for? Tractors, trucks, equipment, spray equipment, people. Farmers need to have space so that they can get their equipment in to do their work. So who runs a John Deere through their backyard? Okay, you need more space for your trees then in order to get your John Deere through there. But in general, the other 60 of you in here don't run a John Deere through your backyard. You don't need to consider agricultural spacing. All you need to do is consider the largest piece of equipment that you're gonna run through your orchard and space for you and you're good. So you can do things different than what a farmer would do. A farmer wants to grow a lot of fruit, you want to grow a little bit of a lot of different varieties. So the six successive <coughs> ripening um, uh, tendencies work out really well for backyard growers to have that extended harvest. So if I work in 
you know, several plum varieties, several peach varieties. I've got some citrus varieties. I have some avocados. I've got some subtropicals, maybe some grapevines or passion fruit. So by having a little bit of a, of a large variety of material, now I can harvest fruit every single day out of my yard. You know, this morning I could have gone out and picked, um, I can pick loquats now. I can pick um, mandarins. I have <coughs> navel oranges. The uh, blood oranges are, are ripe now. There's Oro Blanco grapefruit still out there. I can pick Fuerte avocados today. I still have some bacon avocados on the tree. The halves are just about there. So by growing these successive ripening varieties of a lot of different types of fruit, I can harvest something every single day out of my yard. And I, and I do. You know, my wife and I eat an avocado or half an avocado every day. We're always looking for using whatever's fresh out of the yard. So, you know, going out, spending 10 or 15 minutes in the yard, picking a few pieces of fruit and having those available for meals and just for snacks is, has been a wonderful thing. It's been a great experience for me to be able to grow fruit on a scale like that and not, not ever have to worry about having too much of anything. Size control trees, two or three or four trees in the space of one. So instead of getting 350 pounds of nectarines, I'm getting 30 or 40 or 50 pounds of each variety over an extended period of time. So making makes that fruit usable. You know, you can use 30 pounds of nectarines in two or three weeks, but I can't use 300. I'm not, I'm not making uh, uh, nectarine preserves or peach preserves and I, you know, I don't, I, don't, I don't bake pies and things like that, so all I really want is fresh fruit. And to have those successive ripening varieties like that works out really well for, for my, my lifestyle. So second most important concept, successive ripening varieties so you have a little bit of fruit all the time instead of a lot of fruit at any one given time. Number three is really pretty simple. Grow what you like and what you'll use. It doesn't do you any good to grow varieties that don't fit into your daily culinary lifestyle or things that you don't enjoy eating. And I, I had a, I still, I've used this, I've used this for 10 or 12 years now. I had a, a great call a few years back. It was around um, middle of September and the guy says to me, uh, what do you do with quince? He goes, about uh, five years ago, I went down to the Kmart and they had all their leftover bare root trees on sale for $5. I said, hey, that's a great price. You can't, you can't grow a tree for $5. So they're losing money on whatever they're selling. He goes, yeah, you know, but all they had left were quince. So I bought five of them. <laughs> so minimal financial investment of $25. But now consider five years worth of your garden space, five years worth of irrigation, fertilization, pruning, sculpting, growing those trees to be beautiful, healthy, productive quince trees and having no idea what to do with the fruit. He says, yeah, I went out and picked a fruit and took a bite out of it and I threw it down on the ground. It was horrible. Well, it's, quince is, is not a, a fruit that you eat out of hand. It's a processing fruit. You make jams and jellies, and, and my grandmother used to make some fantastic uh, quince tarts, and you know, I, I, it, it's, it's a fruit that they use, they enhance it and do other things with it. He goes, well, really all I wanted was just to eat some fresh fruit. So <laughs> not understanding what he was doing, he just went out there and did the shotgun approach and, and planted five of the same thing that he really didn't like in the first place. Do your homework. Make sure you're planting varieties that you'll use. Make sure they're varieties that your wife or your kids or your grandkids or your neighbors like because you'll probably be sharing some fruit even if you have small size managed trees. You can still have a, a, a fairly large amount of fruit available. So do your homework. Make sure they're varieties that are adaptable to your area. Make sure they're varieties that you like to eat. Don't go too far out on a limb. And I, and I don't wanna say don't experiment because if you don't experiment, then you're only planting commodities. You know, you, 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 I mean, and, and commodities are great. I love Washington Naval Orange and Hass Avocado and Fuji Apple and Santa Rosa Plum and all those, you know, commodity fruit tree varieties. They're all wonderful. But if you don't save some space to experiment, you're never going to get to try any of the, of the new releases that come out. When UCR's releasing new avocado and citrus varieties all the time. Zager Genetics and Dave Wilson Nursery are releasing new uh, stone fruit interspecifics every year, you know, three, four, five, six varieties every year. I can't imagine that I, can't, I wouldn't have space to try some of those. So my philosophy on that is always about 
tried and true varieties that have a good reputation in the area, and 20% of my space is gonna be experimental so I can try something new. And you know what happens? Almost every year, I'll look at a variety and say, yeah, it's been in four or five years. It really, it really didn't do what I expected it to do. I was hoping it would be lower chill. I was hoping it would be more adaptable to my soil conditions or my climate in the area, but it doesn't seem to be. So you know what that means? That means I've got another space. <coughs> that means I can take that variety out and try something new. Or I can, I can get some propagation wood and I can graft something over. I can take a peach tree that didn't do well for me and I can graft it with a peach variety that will. So you can always make those things work to your advantage. People look at it as a failure, but it's not really a failure, it's an opportunity. It's an opportunity to do something new and exciting and enhance your landscape with a variety that, that is gonna do well for you. So don't ever consider that a failure, just consider it an opportunity to do something new. So those are the three basic concepts. Size control your trees so they're manageable for you, grow successive ripening varieties so you have a little bit of fruit all the time instead of a lot of fruit at any one given time, grow varieties that you like and you'll use, varieties that are adaptable to your geography and your climate. So, any questions on those three things before we move on? Okay, anything else? All right, let's move on. So as long as we're pruning, we might as well take a look at this Snow Queen Nectarine. Uh, Snow Queen is an old, old uh, John Armstrong variety. Goes back to. Uh... If you've enjoyed this educational moment by Ivory Organics, be sure to like it, and most importantly, by subscribing below, you'll be connected to this and all of our other educational gardening videos. Thanks again for watching, and happy gardening. Mm -hmm.